Hello, dear friends, lovely audience. Welcome to the East West Show. Jack Chow on the East West with the Chin E TV.、Uh, at this very moment, as we speak,、uh, our President Donald Trump is in Beijing, China.、Uh, probably he will meet with the President of China, Mr. Xi Jinping, at this very moment. Or right now they're sleeping. I don't know. I don't think they are meeting. Probably tomorrow.、Uh, we are talking about. To give a little comment about、uh, what to expect, with me today is my good friend, my new friend, Mr. Keith Fink. He is a former professor for UCLA for law, teaching laws, and he is one of the top, I would say, very top、uh, attorneys for、uh, work comp laws. So, Mr. or Professor Fink, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jack, for having me.、Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Actually, it's employment law, not workers' comp law. Employment law. Yes. All right. Okay. See. Okay. Anyway,、uh, as we started, when we say these two present of、uh, two countries putting together, especially when we have a common problem with North Korea, what do you hope? Well,、Please. I was very excited when Nixon opened、uh, up China to the United States some over forty years ago.、Uh, Because my second home is actually in Macau,、uh, ah. and I love China, and I love、uh, Chinese culture, and I love the Chinese people.、Uh, and if more Americans were exposed、uh, to the wonders of China,、uh, we would all be enriched.、Um, so yes,、uh, you know, I'm hopeful that、uh, President Trump has a good meeting. We certainly have a unity of interest uh, uh, against the North Koreans. Uh, but yes, but on a larger picture,、um, yes, I'm very hopeful that、uh, our relationship、uh, will continue to grow with China.、Mm -hmm. Now everybody、uh, talks about the fact that、uh, China and the United States, if put together, their efforts would probably bend the wish or whatever the will of、uh, Kim Kim Jong Un of North Korea with his nuclear programs. Do you think that's a hope? That's a legit hope? Well, the U.S. could bend、um, North Korea in a second、uh, if we wanted to, without.、Uh, Fear of、uh, incurring the wrath of China, so、uh, we don't need the United States doesn't need Chinese assistance in in squashing North Korea.、Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you mean militarily? Correct.、Mm. Correct. Yeah, but uh, uh, I mean, diplom diplomatically, diplomatically. Do you think that、uh, U.S. and China will work together this time? I think we have to.、Uh, you can't. Uh -huh. uh, you know, no, no country can deal with a terrorist. No, no, no non-terrorist country can deal with a terrorist. Uh -huh. uh, he is a terrorist. He's not rational.、Um, so yes, we have a we have a common、uh, yeah we have a com common interest. We have a common enemy here.、Mm -hmm. Common interest with common enemy.、Uh, we hope、uh, the two present to.、Uh, I mean. Right now, in in Beijing, will work out something that is to the、uh, best hope. To me,、uh, the worst thing in on earth would be that U.S. China do not get along, and the best thing would be, on the contrary, that U.S. China put their hands together, put their hands together, well, to get something done, get some job done. Especially at this moment, the North Korean nuclear program is the big job. We want to get a job done. Thank you for that comment, sir. All right. Okay, now. To start the show, I want to go with you the fact, and you told me that you were born here, all the way about half of your life. You you never leave a circle of five or ten miles. And once you decide to go, you went all the way to Macau, right? Quite a life. Yes. Well, everybody's an immigrant、uh, in the United States,、mm -hmm. so I come from a European background, and my. Work ethic was from my, you know, from my parents, is this you study as hard as you can, and I went to UCLA. I was a debate champion for three years at UCLA,、mm -hmm. and then after UCLA, I taught a little high school, and then I went to law school, made sure I graduated、uh, high in my law school class, and then I worked very hard as a lawyer.、Mm -hmm. And so I was, you know, raised as you don't take a lot of time off, you don't travel all over the world. Maybe when you're 65 and you're 70, you retire. Mm. Um, I was somewhat so. My whole life was pretty much just living、uh, in in California.、Uh, I grew up in Bel Air, was a pretty nice area. And、uh, a friend of mine, when I was in my 40s, I'm giving away my age.、Uh, <laughs> uh, in my 40s, my best friend,、uh -huh. uh, who had been doing business in Hong Kong, he told me,、um, "You're missing out. You absolutely have to come to Hong Kong." And I said to my friend, 
I can't do this. I have to take a week off of work and a ticket because I only fly business because uh, getting older, it's hard mm, to fly economy. Uh, and the ticket's going to be $7,000. And, and uh, I have been successful in, in my business and $7,000 is not, not mm. that much money. He said, don't be silly. Uh, I'll buy you the ticket anyway. You absolutely have to come. So I took seven days off work. I went to Hong Kong. I fell in love with Hong Kong, although now having been all over China, uh, and all over Asia. Hong Kong's not so exciting. It's pretty much like uh, mm. San Francisco. Mm. Uh, but I went over to Macau when it was just a small Portuguese colony with the cobblestone streets. It didn't have all the hotels. And I fell in love with the people and the culture uh, of Macau. Mm. And so that's, um, and that's how uh, kind of my life yeah. changed a large part because I stopped working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, just on my business. And whenever um, my, my teaching uh, obligations, because that's from my heart, my teaching, mm. not that my heart isn't in uh, fighting hard <laughs> for my clients, right. but my heart is in mm. helping young people. Mm. Uh, and whenever my class would end, I would be on the midnight Cathay Pacific flight. Uh, yeah, I have to fly into Hong Kong, because you either you can't fly directly to Macau, it's so small. You're flying either directly to Hong Kong, or I would go on either airlines uh, to Taiwan, directly into Macau. Ah, uh, I see. By looking at your business card, you, uh, I mean, you based on yourself, Los Angeles dot Macau, meaning that you're flying back and forth all the time, right? At least 10 times a year, yes. At least 10 but times for me, a year, it's, yeah. uh, mm. for, for those people in, who, who know how, uh, where Macau is, it's hard. It's planes, trains, and automobiles. Mm -hmm. I have to fly into Hong Kong, and then when you get into Hong Kong early, there's no direct ferry. Uh, so then I have to go take a train from Hong Kong uh, to Central, and before I can get to the ferry, and then I have to take a ta cab, and then I have to take a ferry, and then I finally land in Macau, <laughs> and then I have to take a taxi. I um, see. Hopefully that my I Cantonese see. is okay, because uh -huh. um, mm -hmm. I speak more Mandarin than Cantonese, and then I finally get to my apartment. But So for me now, it's uh -huh. it's easy, but for most I folks, see. it's pretty uh, a daunting task. I know you, Los Angeles, you're, you're, you're doing laws, right? And in Macau, what do you do? Wo mai mai fang di chang. I buy and sell real estate. Oh, I see. That was my attempt in Mandarin to say the same thing. But, oh, I see, uh, yeah, I see. So, uh, but my accent isn't too good on my mind. Not, huh? not, not a far away <laughs> from your law practice, is it? I do some real estate litigation work, but yes, I would say it's mm. far away. I have also real estate investments in, uh, in the United States, but I've been I more see. successful in, in Macau. Um, mm. Now, Macau's tried to institute various laws for, I don't know, I wouldn't call myself a speculator, but for uh, foreign businessmen like myself, they've, uh -huh. they've made it a little more difficult. But um, that's primarily what I do. Mm, I see, I see, okay. How do you, you mentioned also the fact that you went to Dalian or so? And Xinyang. I did. Actually, my, my friend is, uh, you know, I have many, many friends. My friend mm -hmm. actually came to the show. He wanted to meet you. I said, uh, uh, my, mm -hmm. my friend and interviewer is a Dalian Ren, and she is from Dalian, uh, although she's very proud to be from Los Angeles. So she took me, uh, we had a business meeting. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, this person from Shenyang, who is my, my friend, he owns uh, Wen Chuan. Mm -hmm. uh, so we went to see his uh, the hot springs business, and I got to go to the 918 museum. Mm -hmm. I did many many fun things in Shenyang. Enjoyed the, and then we went over to Dalian. Mm -hmm. And I told as I told you, Dalian uh, is a beautiful city with unbelievable seafood. <laughs> so uh, I had I had a great that. time. Uh, Thank you for saying that. <laughs> I was born in Shandong, Yantai, across the uh, ocean, little bay bay area. Uh huh. And most of my part was in Dalian, my early life. So Dalian is never a strange town to me. I consider Dalian and Yantai both my hometowns. Thank you for loving my hometown. By looking all over China, by traveling all over China, I believe you have witnessed how deeply U.S. and China are kind of like uh, merged into each other. Is that a fact? or some wrong take? I don't see that take at all. You don't think that that at all? Not at all. Uh-huh. So you're not seeing that U.S., China, and I mean, business-wise, got into any kind of connection that they cannot tear away from each other. I see lots of uh, McDonald's or Pizza Hut all over China. Okay, well, you see that over. I mean, you can see that in India. You can see that it everywhere. Uh huh. I see. All right. Okay. So that doesn't mean that U.S. and China 
has any kind of uh, reason well, to... Well, you're saying, look, when I go, when I go all over China, I don't mm. see uh, many Americans in China. I mean, I think there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, mm. One is the difficulty in getting from the United States to China. I mean, I explained my, the arduous task for me to get to, uh, to Macau, mm. but just mm. it's, it's 16 hours. Americans don't have, you either get one or two weeks vacation time. To spend a day or two days flying, that's, that's difficult. Second, it's a lot easier for Americans to go to Europe, okay? People look the same. They speak the same language. People just feel more comfortable uh, going to Europe. Uh, mm -hmm. For me, uh, I'm somewhat uh, of an iconoclast. I feel comfortable uh, in Asia. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but for, for most Americans, it's uh, uncomfortable. You stand out. People don't speak the language. You know, in mo most of the places I go, you know, sure, in a big city in Shanghai, you can stay mm -hmm. in uh, a five-star hotel and people speak the language. But places I go, if I take from Zhuhai to uh, Guilin uh, and I go to Guilin, uh, there's going to be very minimal English spoken. Uh, so uh, so it's, it is difficult for a, uh, for a traveler. Uh, so I don't see, so first off, I don't see many Americans. Uh, you mentioned some major franchises, mm -hmm. but, uh, but overall, uh, there's not, you know, yeah, Guilin is an example. There's one Shingbak. Uh, uh, there's one Starbucks yeah, yeah, in yeah, yeah. Uh, in mm -hmm. Guilin. So you know, an American, oh, you're getting jittery all over. You know, I need mm -hmm. to have my my American coffee. So no, I don't see uh, American businesses really uh, immersed. Uh, mainly, I go to a beautiful place like Hangzhou. I can't even think I eat at gran uh, Grandma's. I think it is is a restaurant I like in Hangzhou. Mm -hmm. But when I'm in Hangzhou, walking around West Lake, I don't see any trappings of the West. So I I, on my own personal experience, I don't see it. That's one of the things I, I like. That means, that means uh, and, 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 ple and, and please, no, please, China, keep your own cultures. No, this was a, this was a big mistake that China made. Uh, in Tiananmen, um, in, the, in the palace, they let in Starbucks coffee. The Chinese people were rightly furious at that. Uh -huh. uh, and then they changed that. Mm -hmm. But you, know, you, don't, you, don't, you, don't strip, you don't strip away Starbucks, your- Starbucks in China is now starting to sell teas. Yeah, okay, well, that's, that's smart. Yeah, okay, well, I think that's really right. dis anyway. disingenuous, but yes. But in Macau, uh, do you uh, see the Chinese, same Chinese that you travel in China all over? A well, okay, wise, now we're getting into, uh, you know, look, you're getting in Macau, you know, Hong Kong, you know, Hong Kong people don't like mainland people. So you're going to say, I think Macau people uh, are, are a little more uh, forgiving vis-a-vis -vis mainland. So you're, am I answering your direct question? Mm. Uh, you know, when we're talking about Hong Kong and Macau, I mean, we're, we're, you know, these two SARs, they really are a world away to a certain extent uh, from mainland China. Mm. You know that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, I just think as a human being, and this, this upsets me, just like if you're born in El Paso, Texas, or you're born in Juarez, I say this, you won the sperm lottery. If you ask anybody, you'd rather be born in the United States than in Mexico. Mm. But we're all the same people. It is the same thing. If you're born mm. in Hong Kong and you're born in Shenzhen, you're no better because you were born in Hong Kong than Shenzhen. Mm. This is just something that... that, that uh, uh, upsets me just as a human being when people think they're better than somebody else just because where they're born. So you know, back to your question is, mm -hmm. I think Macau people are different than mainland people, uh, the way they think. Hong Kong people are definitely their own, uh, their own animals. Uh, and it's not even dealing with you know, the democracy, uh, mm -hmm. which is so fervent mm -hmm. in Hong Kong, not so much in Macau. I agree with that. We're all human race. We're all human race. We were born equal. And uh, let me say my dear audience is my friend, Mr. Keith, uh, Fink, Mr. Keith Fink was a former professor at UCLA. He's now practicing law. He is also, uh, he deals with real estate uh, litigation and uh, lots of experiences of international traveling to Europe, to China, to Hong Kong, to Macau, and of course domestically to the, into the United States. Uh, that's your camera, right? Okay. You look at that yes. camera, not that camera. Okay. Uh, sure. mm -hmm. Action. Hello, dear friends, my lovely audiences. Welcome back to the show. Uh, we started with a little conversation between me and my good friend, Mr. Keith Fink, uh, a, a lawyer, one of the top, law top lawyers for the United States, uh, talking about his travel experiences with Euro, you know, Europe, in China, in Hong Kong, Macau, and a little comparison about traffic and everything of different places, and talking about email connection or stuff, uh, so on and so forth. Generally, I have questions regarding the uh, 
wage and hour pays or salaries are questions I may ask you if uh, I wonder if I may please there's nothing you can't ask me I will right. always give you a direct answer and if I don't know the answer I'll All tell right, you very I don't good. Know. I have a bunch of friends who are being sued they are of course business owners who are being sued for the fact that they their employees are not having lunch within five hours when they started work so to what kind of law does that apply, please? Well, I say every business owner above their uh, office uh, should have this placard that says, no good deed goes unpunished. Uh, and so this, this is the way it is how, trying to run a business in California in the United States. Uh, anytime uh, an employee uh, is let go uh, or has a disagreement with an owner, uh, they're going to sue. And our laws are so complex, they will find some wrong to possibly to file a lawsuit. So your question is a very good one. This is one of the picayune laws that we have in California that many businesses don't, don't know about. So you must give your employee within the first five hours, you must give them a rest break of 10 minutes and you must give them a meal break. And the meal break just can't be a meal break. It must be an uninterrupted meal break. So you can't just simply say you have a meal break, but force uh, the person, let's say Jack, this person that's filming us today is working for you. And you say, sure, you get 30 minute uh, break, but you have to eat while you're doing this, this filming segment. That is not an uninterrupted break. So your friends, unfortunately, uh, if they didn't have a policy in writing that everybody got that told them that you're, so you get uh, your break and they didn't get these breaks, they have a valid claim. Now your friend, had they called me, I would have said, hey, maybe your employees don't want to have the meal breaks. And then what we should do is we should have them sign something called a waiver. You can have a waiver of the first uh, meal period. So. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I don't know all the circumstances around uh, your friend's claim, but if they didn't afford the employees uh, their meal break within the first five hours and they didn't have a waiver, then they have legal exposure. And if you think these things are small, they are not. Uh, to, uh, I sometimes refer to this as a tail wagging the dog. It's not simply what you owe the employee for the hour uh, of their, uh, their wage. There's all sorts of statutory penalties. So every pay period uh, that these violations occur, there's statutory penalties of thousands of dollars that just stack up week after week after week. And of course, in every lawsuit, there's the same winner, and that's the lawyers. And so even if you wanted to resolve these cases and pay the people for the time, uh, their lunch time and the penalties, you gotta pay the beast, and that's the lawyers. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the reason the legislator put these laws in effect is to encourage people to follow the law. If you don't follow the law and there's small violations, we need lawyers to file these lawsuits. But legal fees in these matters can be hundreds of thousands of dollars if your friend didn't give a number of people I, lunch breaks. Sure, so sure. so mm -hmm. this small lunch break issue can wipe out a business owner. You're so, right. so mm -hmm. this is, um, you know, I'm glad that you raised this issue and we could talk to some of your, uh, your listening audience about mm -hmm. this. So meal break and rest break uh, uh, issues are significant in the state of California. Mm. Uh, of course, the laws are laws. We, uh, well, we can, once there's a law, we can do nothing about it by the respect, right? No, that's, not, that's not right. Mm -hmm. Not in this country, no. Okay. Uh, the beauty what of this we country, do? we can change the laws. Mm -hmm. If you think that laws are uh, incorrectly decided, unjust, or outdated, mm -hmm. you can go to your legislator and you can have and seek the uh, change by, uh, by, uh, by your legislators and vote out of office those legislators uh, who are not uh, you know, respecting um, you know, the rational uh, view of the people. So in many of these areas, there's significant pushback uh, by the people to change the laws. Uh -huh. I mean, how about, take for example, you didn't ask a business owner with the Americans with Disability Act. Mm -hmm. So your friends, maybe if they have that restaurant or where they're worried about that wage and hour claim, mm -hmm. there are people that are uh, in wheelchairs, that they, there's a cottage industry. They are making a fortune getting in their wheelchair, <laughs> going into your restaurant, right. and they know the laws, finding mm -hmm. out when they go into your bathroom that you mm -hmm. don't have two rolls mm -hmm. of paper or the bar is one inch lower. How about this law? You give a safe harbor. That means if there is a, uh, a deficiency 
in having your structure comply with what the law requires. The business owner, once they get notice of this, has 90 days to make a correction. And mm -hmm. then if they don't make the correction, well, okay, then they should, they should you know, suffer the consequences of that. Mm -hmm. To me, that's a rational law. Clint Eastwood tried to fight uh, on this a long, uh, many years ago. It was unsuccessful. He's pushing for a similar law like this. So that's kind of my short thing is no, we don't have, sure, we respect the laws, but we can fight mm -hmm. for change in the laws. Mm -hmm. All right. How often did it happen in history that the laws are changed because there are rebounds like this. All over. I mean, and there was the, an 1882 uh, I mean, Exclusion Act for Chinese. I mean, ch Chinese are well assimilated, uh, and we have all sorts of laws that prohibit discrimination. That's federal we, law. We're talking about California law okay, okay, well, being uh, overturned by 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 voters, by uh, constituents. Any example, it, it, successful well, it example? Ha it happens all the time. I mean, we add various provisions uh, mm -hmm. to, we're talking about wage and hour laws now, we add various provisions uh, to our labor laws. Uh, we, right. we add some, we take some away. I know we're gonna get into this hour mm -hmm. on a topic, mm -hmm. uh, a little different topic on sexual assault on campuses. I see. Uh, people wanted to, so the federal law was taken away. The people in the state wanted to import the federal law of Title IX into state law. Governor Brown, who happens to be liberal, vetoed that. So, I mean, they're, they're innumerable. All right, very good. Uh, uh, the wage and hour laws in, includes a situation. I probably have a good example. I have a friend named Houston, uh, David Houston. He is a restaurant owner up in Pasadena. And he is sued for lots and lots of money because those employees of his, on way out to their lunch and the lunch break, they are kind of sometimes stopped by, by, by incoming comer, customers saying, asking, where's the ladies' room, where's the men's room? Mm -hmm. So this very employee might turn over to point to the back. So make a right turn right, uh, to the bottom or whatever, something like that. And each time ask, it takes about two or three seconds. And then over the years, over the days, over the month and everything accumulated to over time, that claims to be not paid. Do you think that is also included in the hours and the pay laws? Yes, but I didn't, and I'm following exactly what Mr. Houston's policy is. I remember I told you it has to be a 30 minute uninterrupted break. Mm -hmm. So if a person is just standing like a statue uh, and, and in, uh, eating the lunch and mm -hmm. folks can come and say, uh, where is the bathroom? Well, that's not a 30 minute uninterrupted lunch break. Mm -hmm. So he should have some kind of mechanism, whether there's a lunch room, uh, let them go outside if there's walking distance to a restaurant. Uh, so he should have some policy in place. But yes, if, if he has them in a location where they have to field questions from mm. customers, then it's not an uninterrupted break. If, it, right. if there was a de minimis, if, uh, a de, you know, one instance where one question was asked, no, I don't think he would violate the law. I now, see. we haven't gotten into, I mean, you asked me, overtime. Overtime, is, is Mr. Mm. I mean, has Mr. Houston got overtime problems? Yeah, probably, uh, probably overtime, yeah. I don't know the difference between the hourly pay and overtime, the argument in between. Well, but, okay. Well, so, so this, well, well, he's sued for for that. He can sue for everything, but this is a problem in running a restaurant. Look, mm -hmm. well, an average restaurant, let's say, uh, Mr. Houston, if it's an Asian restaurant, you're not serving breakfast, so he probably opens at 11:30, and it probably closes at 10 o'clock. So if you're going to have a worker, right, and maybe you shut down at 2:30 because there's no business between 2:30 and 5. So you've got one issue is what do you do in that gap between 2.30 and 5? Mm -hmm. If you just tell your people, oh, you can go sleep. Mr. Houston has you know, a nice fancy cot in the back and go sleep. Do you have to pay people for that time? Is this a, this a split shift issue? So there, you do have to give some compensation for folks that are working that entire time. Mm -hmm. You then take that full day. Let's just say you take that day uh, between 11.30 and 10.30. Once you go over eight hours, you're required to pay your employees time and a half. And when you go over 12 mm -hmm. hours in a day, you have to pay your employees double time. That's, mm -hmm. that's expensive. All right, okay. As a lawyer though, okay, oh, uh, let's take a short moment. And when we come back, we'll continue. I'll continue to ask questions, including even Title, uh, title IX. May I please? Sure. All right, thank you very much. Hello, my dear friends. Uh, welcome back to the discussion about laws about California. With me is my good friend, Mr. Keith Fink, 
Mr. Keith Pink is one of the uh, uh, top lawyers of the United States, and he focuses with uh, with uh, workers in the hourly laws. I'd say it's employment law, wrongful termination, harassment, discrimination. Employment laws, including harassment and discrimination. All yeah, right, wage good. and hour. Yeah. All right, very good. And that probably well, 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 gives me a hint that we can talk about the <laughs> the Feinstein case. The, 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 the Harvey, Harvey, Harvey Weinstein? Harvey, uh, Harvey Weinstein? Yes. Yeah, he's uh, uh, belong to, uh, well, anyway, and the, he's being sued. Anyway, okay. Let me g g get back to my starting point without uh, being dragged away too far. So as a lawyer yourself, though, do you think it's necessary for, for uh, laws to go that strict? Because to me, it directly hits the small business, which is backbone of the California economy. Well, if your precise question to me is, do I think that yes. we should have sexual harassment laws, I have an interesting take on that is no, we should not. Uh, it, people don't realize this, but there actually was a time in this country when businesses existed and flourished without sexual harassment laws. Now, does that mean that uh, I condone sexual harassment? Of course not, but just think about it for a minute. If your boss touches you inappropriately, does mm -hmm. that mean you don't have legal claims without sexual harassment laws? Everybody knows the answer to that is you do have legal claims. You can sue for assault, you can sue for battery, you can sue for intentional infliction of emotional distress. There are a whole host of laws that allow you to go after conduct which has been encompassed under sexual harassment laws. This is a point we touched on earlier. Sexual harassment laws are better than these other laws because one of the components it gives a litigant is to get a truckload of money in the form of attorney's fees if you prevail on a claim. So uh, I sort of have a heretical view if you're asking me the broad question is do we need sexual harassment laws? Maybe, maybe not. And going back to should we reform sexual harassment laws? I think we should. But that could be a conversation for mm. another day, but uh, okay. uh, probably an interesting Oh, sounds uh, interesting. Answer. Yes. How about Title IX? That Title IX is a nightmare that has been, uh, in my opinion, has been outdated on many levels. Uh, and in the instance uh, that we're going to discuss today, uh, should be troubling for every American. Uh, as you know, Title IX uh, was enacted some 45 uh, years ago. It's uh, 37 words that guarantees uh, students uh, equal educational benefits, equal opportunity in educational programs for uh, institutions that receive federal funds. And most people know about Title IX in the context of athletic programs. So for example, um, uh, I went to UCLA in the early 80s. UCLA was very successful in swimming and gymnastics. And in fact, they won national championships from that. Nowadays, they don't have those programs because they had to eliminate those programs in order to have some type of proportionality between males and females in athletic programs. Uh, so Title IX was born of an age when actually if you looked at the demographics of a university, you wouldn't see that many females. Nowadays, if you actually look at the opportunities, uh, I know at UCLA, for example, in the department I taught, there's more females than males. Mm -hmm. So I think that the uh, reason for the law, the, incep the reason back then, while it may have been valid, doesn't apply today. Now, the topic that we're going to discuss now has to deal with Title IX uh, in connection with sexual assault uh, and sexual harassment proceedings. And what uh, the controversy uh, that sprung up uh, Betsy DeVos, the um, new um, uh, secretary of the Department of Education, uh, in September withdrew, there was a speech she gave at George Mason on September 7th, she withdrew two extremely controversial guidance set forth during the Obama administration. Mm -hmm. One refers to something called the Dear Colleague Letter, and the second refers to questions and answers in 2014. Mm -hmm. And so uh, why did she do this? She did this because on the one hand, you have a serious issue of sexual harassment and sexual assault, which we want to interdict on all of our campuses. Uh, we don't want anybody to feel fear of intimidation, assault, or harassment. But on the other hand, you have rights of young people accused of these types of, they're not crimes, if, they're, if someone's not law enforcement going against them, but accused of these serious offenses. 
to which if you are found responsible, they are life altering. You are likely going to be thrown out of the school, be labeled a rapist or a harasser, maybe not get into another school, and that will haunt you the rest of your life, your, your, your rest of your career. Hmm. So the Dear Colleague letter did a number of things, the Obama administration. Uh, uh, first, I think it was illegal in that it didn't follow the APA in allow for advice and comment before these uh, rules went into place. But it, let me just tick off some of the troubling aspects which uh, uh, has now been rolled back by uh, withdrawing these guidances. Number one, the burden of proof in order to determine that somebody committed an assault or harassment was lowered from clear and convincing, which is 75%, to preponderance of evidence, which is just more likely or not, 50.01%. Basically, you are presumed guilty. Mm. That's number one, and that's the biggest problem. Mm. I can just stop there on that. Easy to get, easier to get convicted. Easy. It's relatively simple. I mean, in, mm. all, all, once the complaint is made, all, you're already guilty because, mm. right? They made the complaint. Well, it's more likely than not that it happened. Mm. Uh, Okay, well, that's number one. Uh, now, remember, what, she, what as she's actually done here is she's just taken away the guidance. She has now left it up to the schools to go back to the old standard or keep uh, the current standard. And unfortunately, mm. these liberal universities that are run by progressives that care, uh, to me, not a whit about affording due process uh, to students, they are ignoring uh, uh, the, the suggestion by the department. Okay, the second, second thing, you are not allowed an attorney in these types of proceedings. Now, how can an 18-year-old accused of, in essence, rape, sexual assault, uh, deal with these accusations, be able to put together, uh, put together oh. evidence? I, I can just give you an example. And this was, uh, an Asian students, mm. they are in a world of trouble. Mm. First, because of Asian culture. Many Asian students don't tell their parents when they're accused of, uh, uh, of issues like this for fear of rep uh, reprisal from, uh, or shock and outrage from their tiger mothers or their tiger parents. It's a lot more likely that Caucasian students will seek uh, uh, relief from their parents. So many Asian students don't go, and so many Asian students at UCLA, for example, too, are here and their parents are at home. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's difficult, and you're not really not going to reach out to your, 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 your parents in Shanghai and say, I've been accused of rape. So, and so that is a problem. Uh, uh, these students don't have uh, the right to a lawyer. They don't have the right to get legal advice. And secondly, I do think there's an element of discrimination that goes on in these processes if you're uh, a person that happens to be of Asian, whether that's Indian or Chinese, you are not getting the same shake as somebody who's white. So you don't have the right to cross-examine. The, uh, uh, oh, well, I say you don't have the right to attorney. The next is you don't have a right to cross-examination. Mm. Any lawyer will tell you the best engine in the search for truth is the right to cross-examine. You don't have a right to cross-examine the person uh, that's confronting you. You don't have a right to see all the evidence that's against you. It's whatever evidence is deemed uh, uh, relevant. Mm. By whom? The decision maker in this process, mm -hmm. it's not me, mm -hmm. it's not a lawyer, it's not a judge. Most of these, uh, so it's, it's somebody that the Title IX department at these universities has hired to investigate. What is their training in investigation? It's none. Some of them are trained in radical programs that presume guilt against any male in their proceedings. So you have a single investigator investigating. Uh, the old Ob uh, Obama uh, requirements, uh, there's an infamous line from, those, from the guidance that said, don't let, basically, don't let due process get in the way of a speedy investigation. Mm. So you had all of these, uh, and, they, and they tried to have this whole thing conclude in 60 days. There mm -hmm. also, uh, under the Obama guidance, was a right for the accuser, if she lost, she or he, but it's almost always a she, if she lost, mm -hmm. to appeal. That violates a concept we call double jeopardy. Let me go back to this. Uh, I happened to happen this Asian student mm -hmm. uh, was so. Uh, it was. I wish he came to me. I'll give you. I'll give you a contrast. I wish he came to me earlier, mm -hmm. but he came to me only after he didn't tell his parents, uh, and he got crushed and expelled from from a UC school. So one of the smoking gun pieces of evidence that the investigator concluded 
uh, that the girl who was on her 18th birthday was looking to have sex with the 18th fraternity because she hadn't had sex with the 18th fraternity and luckily uh, landed with this uh, 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 Asian student, the smoking gun that she was intoxicated and therefore couldn't consent happened to be a piece of evidence that this young 18-year-old kid gave to her. Now, what was that? It was a photograph of the two of them. All kids do these selfies nowadays. And he was submitting it to show, look it, she was smiling, she was happy, we were getting along, mm -hmm. you know, and we were going to hook up like yeah, college yeah, students yeah. do. Mm -hmm. The investigator jumped on the fact that her face was red. And she said, aha, mm -hmm. I got you. Your face was, her face was ah. red, she was blushed, and that's because of the alcohol. Now this kid, yeah. he's a kid. Mm -hmm. He doesn't know how to peel back the onion. So after he lost and he came to me, I said, wait a minute, let's go look on her Facebook. She either has acne rosea, which is a form of skin disease where your face is red, or this is just her natural skin color. It uh, took me all of 10 seconds to look at her Facebook post from when she's in high school. That's the way she always looks. Mm. Now, you would think a skilled investigator would have done that on her own, which she didn't. Mm. But if you had a lawyer, or not even a lawyer, but you know, some, uh, some yeah, adult, right, somebody right, helping right, you with uh, some uh, knowledge, uh, they, um, that student could have helped. Now contrast that with some, uh, this is an, another Asian student I had at a different mm -hmm. UC campus. He was lucky enough to have a good relationship, uh, this is an Asian American, uh, that went to his parents and they hired me uh, to help him through this process. The administration thought they had him because there was a text from the girl saying, you know what you did was wrong. And he didn't text back and say, what, are you kidding me? We had consensual sex, mm -hmm. he didn't do that. So in the absence of that response, the Title IX Inquisition thought it's a tacit admission. Oh. He said, what, she said, what you did is wrong, and he didn't say, are you crazy? Are you kidding me? What are you talking about? He came mm -hmm. to me and I put together mm -hmm. the truth, the reason why he didn't do it, this was his girlfriend. He had dated her. He knew her background and she had suffered something that's called suicidal ideations. Oh. Somebody that in their life is considering committing suicide, mm. you don't inflame them and push back and get in their face with that type of response. Right. So there's a completely logical explanation which mm. I helped him put forward, mm. put together the evidence that she actually had suicidal ideations, mm. other type of instances where stuff like this had happened. Uh, I submitted uh, documents with textbook, uh, text messages, Facebook posts, uh, cards she had given him. Mm. Uh, this student got off, but he was lucky. So you can't see a lawyer, but you can go to somebody for help that basically help you through the process. He was lucky he got you. Otherwise, he, uh, his life is going to end up in uh, lots of miserable situations. Oh, absolutely. So, uh, so, mm -hmm. this is, so this has been the big issue on campuses. Students mm -hmm. have been railroaded. Uh, their lives have been turned upside down. They have been not been afforded due process. And so Betsy DeVos uh, withdrew, rescinded these old guidance. Uh, and even our governor, who was extremely liberal, Governor mm -hmm. Brown, I think it's Senate Bill 169, recently vetoed Senate Bill 169, which would have mandated that in our schools they imported the same old guidance, made them re requirements, including the low oh, preponderance of evidence. No he, no, he realized, even Governor Brown realized, yeah, you can't mm. dispense with due process in the name of trying to eliminate sexual assault mm. uh, on campus. Mm. And also there isn't enough data mm. to know whether or not these Title IX processes, uh, process is discriminatory uh, versus, you know, protected categories, including Asians. They just don't have those types of data. Uh, well, in summary, do you think Title IX is a law that deserves to be overturned? It's outdated, yes. Significantly it's outdated. modified, it's outdated, right, yes. Very good. Thank you. Thank you for that conclusion. And uh, my dear audience, is I, I'm very thankful to the fact that Mr. Fink give me the answer, gives me the answer that I've been longing for. Let's take a very short moment out. When we come back, we have the last question they ask regarding that. Uh, if I may, I wonder, ask you about the uh, sex, I mean the third bathroom issue. Spending a lot, buying the laws on the campus, all right? Shall we, ask, may I please? Why not? All right, good, all right, good.
Hello, dear friends, my lovely audiences. And finally, I have the chance to have a great friend, Mr. Keith uh, Fink. Mr. Keith Fink uh, was teaching in uh, UCLA for uh, quite some time, like 10 years. And he's also practicing laws. He deals with uh, real estate uh, commercial litigations also. And talking about laws today, I have accumulated lots of law questions law-related questions that I would like to ask him. And I checked with him the possibility of asking him about the third bathroom laws. And I may go ahead, please. Okay. I have a hard time, Mr. Fink, under to understand the why we should have the third bathroom on the campus, please. Well, on that, you're preaching to the choir. Uh, I mean, I view sex as a binary concept, so that's my own view. Uh, so I personally don't believe um, there is a requirement for a third bathroom. But mm. if we're going to have uh, decisions made on whether or not there should be a third bathroom, this is a legislative decision. This is a decision that should not be forced down the people's throats uh, based upon some type of federal edict, some federal mandate. Um, so the people uh, in the state of California or the state of uh, North Carolina or you know, a any state are free to decide differently, Jack, from apparently, you know, you're an I view that and, means personally and have a third you bathroom. Don't like those laws. Correct. That's correct. Oh, very good. And also, uh, I mean, the, the question of, of uh, confusing is that why would a legislator push something down to our throat, something that we do not even want it? And we know we do not want it, and we do not, at least, not necessarily want it. Well, Why you're, you're talking. So? If you're talking about, uh, you, we, uh, you know, we live in the People's Republic of California. You thought you got out of uh, the People's Republic of China. It's a lot worse here. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, uh, uh, the laws. As you see, we're going over the laws are steered against the employers. They're in favor of the employees. Um, it's a very, very leftist. Uh, this is a very, very leftist. Mm -hmm. uh, progressive state. This is the state that wants to shield those that are here illegally. We want to have to, we want this city to be a sanctuary city. Uh, the UC wants to be sanctuary campuses. Uh, there is no respect for the rule of law. Uh, so, it, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't shock me. And then, uh, and, and there's a complete intolerance, Jack, for you and I, mm -hmm. if we uh, oppose this and we want to express our opposition, we are pilloried. Uh, we are made to look uh, uh, as if we're intolerant. Uh, I actually had this issue with, uh, mm. there were some uh, college Republicans at UCLA, they were in Santa Barbara, they, mm. I think they happened to be members of the Broome Republicans, uh, and they were opposing the transgender bathroom laws. And, mm. then their po and then their photo was going around, and mm. immediately the students and the administration and the school paper, they jumped all over them. Jumped all over them for what? Mm. They were simply exercising their right to free expression. And, and shame on all of those uh, that is a marketplace of ideas that the university is supposed to uphold that refuse to allow those with a differing point of view, with a conservative point of view, mm -hmm. wouldn't allow them to uh, expose that point of view. Now, I take that same position uh, even if it was for somebody supporting transgender bathroom. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't change my opinion on free speech just because I may happen to have a different own personal viewpoint. Very good, very good. If you put everything together, though, do you seem to find why California would have those... Uh, uh, a strong position in being politically right. Being politically right has been a slogan for a long time already. No, politically correct. Uh, political correctness. A correctness. A political correctness, right. To be politically correct. So do you think that's the root of it? Well, you know, why is, why is California or New mm -hmm. York um, extremely liberal states? Um, they are liberal states. I don't know, I don't know what the genesis, of the genesis of that is. I mean, mm -hmm. Hollywood, Hollywood, the dominance of Hollywood uh, sure doesn't uh, uh, diminish uh, the aspect of how uh, to the left we are. Mm -hmm. We're but totally, uh, go ahead. I don't, know if I, I don't know if I addressed your specific question. Yeah, I understand. Uh, I, 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 I have been recently, recent years, confused quite a lot about uh, being polit politically correct. That slogan. And I want to find a why. So my question was that if you put all the laws together, you will find a culture that creates the laws. And the culture is the root of the political correctness. Am I right? No, laws are, are supposed to reflect 
the you know the will the sentiment uh, of the people in you know a certain uh, mm -hmm. you know geographic region so the people in the state of Utah okay no doubt uh, have a different view uh, on issues than the people uh, in Berkeley okay so you can have different laws in different states and ju different jurisdictions that's just the way uh, mm -hmm. that uh, it runs in this country we have a separation of powers uh, so uh, I don't know if you're asking me more uh, uh, on, a, you know, why is it that people, you know, have different thoughts in the South yeah, uh, than they do it? in the North? Why I don't know. Uh, I know. I, that's, that's, you know, you're getting a little far out of my field of expertise uh, yeah. as to why, you know. <laughs> yeah. uh, Could so. be. Sometimes <laughs> if you give it a thought, though, and if you were saying that <laughs> what happens in California is caused, the, uh, is caused by the radical left whatsoever, now we're talking about federal. You're talking about the birthday cake. Remember the birthday cake? The yes. legalization of the uh, same-sex marriage and the, uh, for, the, uh, for the bakery that's been fined to be whatever, convicted for not providing service to a uh, same-sex couple. Yeah, well, you're, you're, so but your, viewer, your viewers thing. may not know. Yeah, so people want to, uh, uh, Adam, uh, Adam and Steve go into a bake shop and they want to have uh, their, their, yep. whatever, their, their wedding and they want the, the, the cake, uh, the bakers to have Adam and Steve, okay? And the people uh, are, are sincerely religious, let's say they're Catholics, mm -hmm. and doing that is antithetical to their religious beliefs. Um, so yeah, uh, I think I don't know if you agree with me or not, but yes, I happen to think that that's a violation of the religious freedom uh, mm -hmm. of those people uh, that are running that bake shop. But yes, you're saying the contrary view is it's discriminatory uh, in that they are not getting their cake. But that, that's actually wrong because those Catholic bakers are happy to bake a cake. They just don't. They they just will only bake the cake either with no Adam and Steve on it, or it has to be Adam and Eve, and to put Adam and Steve violates their basic religious tenets. Mm -hmm. So I don't even agree with the underlying uh, legal rationale that's put forward that they are being prohibited from receiving a service. Okay, which is an important dis distinction to make because people should not be in places of public accommodation prohibited from receiving a service. This was a very big problem in our country, as you know, in the, in the 60s. Blacks would come into a restaurant uh -huh. and they wouldn't be served because they were blacks. Okay, exactly the same thing happens. For example, if you go to Home Depot, you go check the sign section, there is a sign saying that by law we resume, we resume the right to refuse service to anybody. What does that mean? So well, they can have you look. You can those have those bakers can say, "Hey, by laws, we reserve the right to refuse service." You are you? you are stretching uh, you are stretching the sign. You are stretching uh, the legal coverage that that sign has. Mm -hmm. So that sign that sign cannot literally be taken as giving you a free pass to reserve right to anybody. You can't reserve. Uh, uh, if let's uh, say so you have that sign at uh, In and Out Burger, which is I, I, I was very yep. excited when I passed In and Out Burger, and I don't get I have no stock in the company. Um, everybody likes In and Out Burger, so uh, they can't. They, they may have that sign. They reserve right uh, to do uh, to serve Not any customer, serve anybody, but they yeah. can't because they see that uh, uh, I'm black, that I'm Chinese, or that I have a purple uh, supporting gay sticker, whatever it is. Those are protected categories that you cannot refuse to reserve, uh, refuse service on. Mm. So that sign to a certain extent is meaningless. But as an owner, I, I, I decide not to give the uh, service to whoever asks for Steve and, and, and Adam and Steve instead of Adam and Eve. Well, so, okay, well the legal argument you're, do, you're doing, I know, well, but the legal argument here is you're doing, is you're, re you're refusing a service on the basis of sexual orientation. So if there's a law that protects sexual orientation, then that action of yours may have triggered that law. Mm -hmm. Now I'm saying is, is uh, putting us, uh, uh, how, how are you refusing a service? The service mm -hmm. is baking a cake. You will bake them the cake. All right. But I, just, yeah. but, I just don't want to carry the letters. Yes. Right? Well, uh, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. There's a between Adam and, Adam and Eve, not Adam and Eve, something like that. Yes. Right? So, can may this uh, I mean by law, may this uh, baker owner just apply his uh, uh, 
freedom of expression? Well, there's been legal arguments that the Religious uh, Restoration Act, that there's certain provisions uh, mm -hmm. in the law that uh, uh, would allow for this based upon certain, uh, certain religious beliefs. I think that should be the law. Mm -hmm. I think the right outcome here is, yes, as long as you agree to bake the cake, you don't deny the basic service, mm -hmm. uh, uh, then they haven't violated the law. They should not be required to uh, violate, and, and, and these are important, these are not trivial, these are right, basic okay, important that, religious that tenets. Of, it's not my religion, but I respect baked, all religions. Right? The, the cake, cake is baked, baked. yes. And, uh, and then yes. they say, I just, the, can't, I just can't write the letters for that's you. That's it, it's a whole different story right. if they refused service to them, refused mm -hmm. to give them any cake at all because of their sexual orientation. Yeah, that is that a I, uh, yes, Well, right. that I, I wouldn't condone, and, and the law see. should come down on that. Very good, very good. Uh, all right, my dear audience, we're a little over time, but I'm very happy I finally found somebody who can answer my uh, Adam and Steve, uh, Adam and Steve question. All right, thank you very much, my dear friends. And to uh, Professor uh, Fink, thank you very much. And uh, I wish you a very happy trip back to Macau, back to Hong Kong, back to Dalian, or whoever. Zhuhai, our, border, Zhuhai. our bordering, right. uh, yes. Very and I hope to be back thank in you, uh, right. Beijing very good. time.